Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Massimo, and everyone for coming. Um, now, I want to say up front, I wish I were here under different political circumstances, um, but I know many of us are still reeling in shock from what happened, no matter who you voted for. Um, but I think these circumstances make philosophy, and perhaps even existential philosophy, um, even more pertinent. You know, it's a stark reminder, at the very least, that we can never take freedom for granted. And existentialism was born from despair. So the existentialists provided a philosophy that was particularly conducive to dealing with extreme situations and great human suffering during World War II because it accounted for the absurdity of existence, it emphasized the value of individual freedom and the tensions in human relationships, not least of all romantic relationships. Um, so we fight, we make love, we marry, we get divorced, we're possessive, we're submissive. I mean, these are the polar extremes of love. Now, mainstream descriptions of romantic love tend to be fairly polarized into more or less happily married couples or serial monogamists on endless falls of dating and Tinder hookups. Um, and even despite Fifty Shades of Greys, you know, lashings of kinky sex, even that kind of fits still into the standard model of boy meets girl and will they or won't they live happily ever after. Now, I haven't read it or I've seen the movie, so I don't know what actually happens, but I'm, I think they end up together, right? Um, so the existential narrative provides a more nuanced approach to romantic relationships beyond these vanilla descriptions of romantic love. Um, so the existential view is, by, is that romantic love is by definition problematic. So, spoiler alert, if you're here to find happiness or the secret of love, I'm sorry, not going to happen, you probably should leave now. <laughs> um, so happiness isn't the goal, but I think that by better understanding the dynamics of romantic relationships, we can make more authentically meaningful choices about our lives. So just to clarify, first of all, what I mean when I say romantic love. So first of all, it's passionate. So it's based on sexual desire. Whether it's actu actually consummated is another matter. But this is what differentiates it from, say, friendship. It also includes the hope that it will last. I mean, maybe not forever, but certainly beyond the night. And that's what differentiates it from lust. It's also personal, which is an appreciation of an individual which differentiates it from, say, spiritual love. And it involves creating a we, which is a merging or like a uniting of lives. So note that this isn't gender specific, it covers the full range of combinations uh, on the gender spectrum. And what I mean when I'm referring to existentialism. So I'm primarily drawing on the philosophies of Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre as well as Kierkegaard, the father of existentialism, and a little bit on Nietzsche, the grandfather of existentialism. So the existential philosophers wanted to create a philosophy that could be lived um, and that was relevant to their everyday lives. So they wrote about sex, love, marriage, work, death, anxiety, and drinking in cafes. <laughs> Um, and while every existential philosopher has a different idea about what relationships are, they all emphasize action. So they throw the spotlight on how lovers choose to behave. And so why are we talking about this? Well, I think in love, we tend to have great expectations about happiness and harmony and relief from our loneliness. So this ideal might well be possible, and that's great, or as Nietzsche would say, either you're lying to each other or everybody else, but uh, he wasn't terribly successful in his relationship, so <laughs> I think we should take that with a grain of salt. Um, so I'm looking specifically at when things don't go as expected, when reality falls short of the ideal. And I think misplaced expectations and unrealistic assumptions are to blame for many of the frustrations and disappointments in romantic relationships. So I'm going to point out five ways in which I think existential ideas can help us be more thoughtful about romantic relationships. First of all, we are alone, but together. Um, so even if we don't believe literally in the idea of a soulmate or another half, I mean, these are terms that are so prevalent 
um, in our narrative about love. And when we're in a relationship, our language changes from an I to a we. And sharing lives is a way of being in romantic relationships. And this feeling of connectivity to another person is part and parcel of romantic love. But the existential view emphasizes that we're all individuals, <clears throat> so there are always going to be some barriers between us. The question is whether we can overcome those barriers. So Jean-Paul Sartre points, to, um, points out that to be able to call ourselves a we, we have to know who the other person is. And we can never actually fully know who the other person is. So Chris Sanicor wrote a review of my book um, last year and compared it to Gone Girl. Has anyone read the book or seen the movie? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So he compared it to this quote, which is in one of the opening scenes. When I think of my wife, I always think of her head. I picture cracking her lovely skull, unspooling her brains, trying to get answers. The primal questions of any marriage. What are you thinking? How are you feeling? What have we done to each other? Um, so this, I think, is a nice analogy to Jean-Paul Sartre's idea about relationships. We want to know the other person, but we can't get inside their head to see what they're thinking. So this is why he went into this theory of sadomasochism, like we're always trying to merge with the other person, and we try to possess them, or we try to be submissive in order to force this merging. But he said there is no exit from this. And he concludes that other people are fundamentally unknowable. Simone de Beauvoir, on the other hand, was a lot more positive. Um, she says, yes, sure, we do tend to get caught up in power struggles in romantic relationships. But she proposed a strategy for overcoming this, which she called intersubjectivity. And one way we can find intersubjectivity, or what she also called immediate communication, is in the emotional intoxication of great sex. Um, so I see where she's going with this. You know, when you're having you know, a great intimate encounter, it feels like you're really close to the other person and there's this sense of oneness. Um, but this is a very tenuous link. I mean, you still can't really know what the other person's thinking. So why is this relevant now? Well, I think social media relationships also highlight this ten tenuousness. You know, we have lots of friends. Um, it makes us feel less alone when we get the little love hearts and likes and thumbs up and retweets. Um, but these relationships are extremely unstable and can make us feel alienated when something like l the election last week happens. Um, we get a condescending comment from someone who we thought was a friend. Or, um, you know, so there's much that divides us and much that works against us achieving this ideal of oneness in love not least political differences. And I think it's true that you can't ever fully comprehend another person's subjective experience, but I don't think it's as disastrous as Sartre implied. It's not true that relationships are always in conflict. You know, there are plenty of ways that we can connect, sharing experiences or sharing time, uniting to work towards the same goals. And this is what is gonna solidify and galvanize relationships. So in love specifically, we should recognize that the unity we seek is very tenuous. Okay, which brings us to number two. Romantic loving is a choice. So romantic loving is passionate. It feels like it's uncontrollable and intoxicating. It's like a drug. I mean, I always think about this Robert Palmer song, might as well face it, you're addicted to love. Or there's Love is the Drug by Roxy Music. But I know, we're supposed to be talking about the 21st century. So here's Keisha. Your love is my drug. <laughs> um, so, I mean, this is one of the wonderful feelings about love, you know, this intoxication. And it's not a problem in itself. But it is a problem if we become slaves to our passions, if we're, we let ourselves be ruled by our immediate natural urges. I mean, this is animalistic. And I think this is the problem with dating apps and websites. Um, they encourage us to make superficial judgments. They encourage us to swipe potential lovers in a flash. You know, we're instinctively reacting to photographs. You might say, oh no, I read the profile. But <laughs> people lie, or at least they present themselves, or present highly edited information about themselves. You know, think about those photographs, airbrushed, filtered, cropped, edited, or the information people present about themselves. 
I mean, partly it's such a narrow set of attributes that we're trying to reduce our being to. Um, and on the one hand, we need to be self-aware self enough to understand what it is that someone else might be looking for uh, um, from us. Um, but that's infinite. And how do we know what's relevant anyway? Um, and so we also, on these websites and dating apps, need to avoid giving away too much information. So, for example, you're not going to say, oh, I really just want to have babies, or I really just want casual sex, or I really just somewhat want someone to spank me. I mean, you may have those, find those things on niche websites, but less so in mainstream ones. So the problem with this is that we're not presenting ourselves in authentic ways. We're presenting ourselves, we think others want to see us, or maybe we're presenting kind of aspirational aspects of ourselves. And you might say, well, this happens in everyday life too. Um, and I think that's true, but social media, I think, exacerbates the tendency towards inauthenticity. Um, have you seen this hipster Barbie Instagram account? I mean, it's a parody account, kind of highlighting how we create very glamorous profiles about ourselves, and sometimes unintentionally. I had a friend who uh, messaged me um, not so long ago and said, Sky, wow, it looks like you're having an amazing time in New York. I follow you on Instagram. And I'm like, oh, if only my life were exactly like my Instagram account, not just the highlights and the beautiful things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, the point of this um, parody account is that it's the same sort of poses in the same locations with all the same hashtags about live authentic. And really, there's nothing authentic about it. So Nietzsche says, that when we use a facade to seduce someone, we're going to end up facing a dilemma. Because by presenting ourselves in such highly curated ways, we risk becoming victims of our own acting skills. Because we have to become our masks in order to sustain the illusions we create. And in the process, we sacrifice authenticity. So first of all, authenticity is a problem. Second problem is, I mean, one of the criticisms about dating apps and websites is that we're spoilt for choice. There are just too many choices. Um, and a potential existential problem is going to arise if we're not making any meaningful choices. So Kierkegaard, in particular, would consider being caught up in monotonous cycles of serial, serial romances and conquests to be part of the aesthetic sphere of life which is exciting, but it's also immature. And he thought it was immature because we're not making any definitive, life-changing choices. And he makes an analogy to crop rotation in farming. So as one crop enters maturity, you start planting seeds in the next um, field for the next season. So just like relationships, when one starts maturing, you start planning for the next one. Um, And Kierkegaard also makes a comparison to Mozart's Don Giovanni. You know, I think Kierkegaard very much admired um, Don Giovanni's sexual prowess, but he also criticised him because he ran around Spain seducing anyone he could find. Um, he was Don Giovanni, Kierkegaard says, was a prisoner to his natural urges. And he wasn't making any choices. He was actually sleeping with anyone in a skirt. Now, Kierkegaard would say it can be an amazing experience for a while, but eventually you'll get bored and plagued with despair. He talks about it, you know, like a stone skimming across water. It's like that's what that kind of lifestyle is like. In any moment, you're going to stop and plunge into the abyss. Um, so Kierkegaard's solution was to make a leap into the ethical lifestyle, make a commitment, accept your duty to others, and get married. So I think Kierkegaard's right on the one hand in that we're missing out on making meaningful connections with people. But I'm not sure that marriage specifically is the answer because we should be free to choose boredom and despair if we wish. But I'm going to come back to this. So further to the question as to whether love is a choice. Now some of you might be thinking, are you crazy? How can I be in love with someone I'm not attracted to? And I would say the existential answer is that it's true that there are some facts of our existence that we can't choose. You know, we can't change the fact that Hillary Clinton isn't president right now. We can't change our parents. We can't change that we were born. I love Kierkegaard's quote on this. He says, who am I? How did I come to be here? Why was I not consulted? And if I am compelled to take part in it, where is the director? I want to see him. 
<laughs> so it's possible, I mean, we can't change our bodies and biology, although medicine, Botox, silicon is changing all that. Um, and you know, this was something Sartre and de Beauvoir um, argued about. Um, Simone de Beauvoir used to get seasick and Jean-Paul Sartre told her it was all in her head. And she's like, no, you're crazy, it's not. Um, so it's possible we can't choose who we feel that romantic spark with. I mean, I know scientists do those sort of smelly, sweaty t-shirt tests, but you know, there's still a lot we don't know about that too. I mean, some people say love is rational. You might have seen in the New York Times a few months ago, um, Aaron's 36 questions that lead to love. I mean, it's an old test, but it got a new lease on life recently. Um, and this is the checklist approach. And that would be a nice way to look at it. It would be an easy way to find love. If only we could find that person who ticks all the boxes. If only we knew what those right boxes were. If only we could find the right algorithm for love. But it turns out that humans are a lot more complicated than that, and romance can't at least yet be defined by an algorithm. Now, Zizek said something sensible recently, before his endorsement of Trump. Um, he said, love is not mental accounting. And I completely agree. I, mean, I think love can't be reduced to a checklist. I mean, on the one hand, there are certain rational elements of romantic love. You can say, well, we love each other, but we want different things out of life, so perhaps we shouldn't continue a relationship together. But love is irrational too. You know, for example, we love people who, you know, rationally, we shouldn't. Now, Nietzsche talks about this. He talks about it in terms of the Apollonian versus the Dionysian, the rational versus the passionate. And he says it's wise to be a little tipsy sometimes, but a strong will coordinates passions and desires in concert with reason. Now Jean-Paul Sartre agreed with this and he thought we're all slaves to love most of the time and it's great to let ourselves be overcome by love. But there is no escape from the responsibility of our actions and we can choose whether to act on our lusty and loving impulses. We can choose whether to try and kiss someone, whether to ask them out on another date. So what this means for today, I think we're hyper-connected, but more alone than ever before. Dating apps are not going to make our choices any easier. So let's not be reliant or overly reliant on them for finding romance, curing loneliness. But I think there's certainly value in them for socializing and opening up possibilities for relationships that we wouldn't have known before, and certainly entertainment. So Kierkegaard's solution was marriage, as I've already mentioned. Um, so, and a lot of people today are rejecting marriage. There are at least as many single adults as there are married adults, um, but it's still a dominant ideal, which brings us to number three. The ideal of romantic loving need not culminate in marriage. So I've talked about the fact that we can choose our behavior and choose to be in relationships. Um, and I've already alluded to the fact that sh we should also be free to choose the type of relationships that are meaningful for us. So it's not only important for us to be aware of our passions, but also about our own implicit expectations and the expectations from society, pop culture, Hollywood, and our families. So we still have this standard narrative of falling in love, finding the one, and living happily ever after, oh, and getting married. So this is just one possibility, and it's not even a new one. Um, marriage used not to be about love, it used to be about um, power alliances, financial alliances, economic alliances, you know, people fell passionately in love, but usually not with their spouses. Um, but with the rise of industrialization and capitalism, um, romantic love emerged as the alternative to arranged marriages. So the ideal that romantic love culminates in marriage is still very pervasive. For example, we had Justice Anthony Kennedy last year on same-sex marriage saying, oh, the highest ideal of love is marriage. The government you know, supports marriage in other ways. You, know, you get social security benefits, tax benefits, health insurance benefits. It's really easy to get married. Just hop on a $99 flight to Vegas. But getting divorced, that's really hard. It's bureaucratic and time consuming. Another example. Has anyone seen Modern Family? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So here we have the nuclear family on the left, husband, wife, three kids. Um, over on the right, we have um, uh, same-sex marriage and adopted children. 
We also have, in the middle, second marriages um, and stepchildren, but they're all still nuclear families. Um, all the adult main characters are married and cohabitating. Gloria, the Latina wife, is the only adult of color. No one in the show is in an open relationship. No one has an affair. No one is alone. Um, so actually, it's not all that modern. And I want to point out that pop culture is still very dominated by the white heteronormative nuclear model. I mean, I've put up a few examples here. You know, has anyone seen The Good Place? It's like a new show with a, one of the main characters is a philosophy professor. Um, and I like this show also because it's subtly, you know, not only the diversity, but it's also subtly critiquing the soulmate idea because they're meant to be in heaven, they're meant to be finally united with their soulmates, but God made some mistakes and um, <laughs> <laughs> they're actually not with their soulmates. Um, so, <clears throat> also, has anyone seen the lobster film that came out earlier this year? Yeah, okay, kind of <laughs> a depressing film in some ways, but um, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's set in the near future, and it critiques the idea that if you're not in a romantic relationship or in a couple or not actively looking for one, then there's something wrong with you. Um, and I recently learned from Kerry Jenkins in her new book that's about to come out called What Love Is, that this is called amatonormativity, which is a term originally coined by Elizabeth Brake. So in this film, um, yeah, if you're like, if you happen to be standing by yourself um, and someone sees you, they'll, you know, you'll become, you'll be interrogated for papers and like, where's your papers? Are you married? Are you in a relationship? Where is your partner? And if it turns out that you're, you are single, then you're sent off to a hotel. You have with other single people. You have 45 days to fall in love, or to pretend you're falling in love. Um, and if you fail, then they let you out into the wild, you're hunted down, um, and if you're caught, um, you're turned into an animal of your choice where you have a second chance at romance in the animal kingdom. <laughs> okay, it's harsh. <laughs> so the point is that you know being alone is still a problem in, in our society. Maybe not as extreme as that yet, thank goodness. But I also wanted to point out that this idea of variety of relationships, it's not new. I mean, Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre, 70 years ago, were critiquing the, this nuclear heteronormative model. So they were radical because they didn't marry, they didn't live together, they didn't have kids, they had open relationships. Simone de Beauvoir had relationships with women. Um, now, they were criticized for going too far because they had relationships with students, which was an abuse of power. But what they did was important because they emphasized the value of being free to choose our relationships, all that as long as they're adult and consenting. And they made the point that the nuclear model isn't for everyone. But I think what gets lost in Beauvoir and Sartre's narrative is that the open relationship isn't for everyone either. And Sartre and de Beauvoir were highly critical of marriage because of the limitations on freedom that it implies, even though they actually had something that looked an awful lot like a marriage, even though they didn't live together. And now they're buried together in, in a, a cemetery in Paris. <clears throat> so how is this relevant now? Well, I think let's not blindly accept conventional roles and customs. So let's question the traditional destiny of being a boyfriend or a girlfriend, husband and wife, and actively choose the type of relationship we want. So you might think love won with same-sex marriage last year, but there's much concern after last week that perhaps that's about to change. Kerry Jenkins says there's a huge, atta huge stigma attached to open relationships because polyamory is illegal in many parts of the world, it also in the US, even though it's not enforced. Um, so Beauvoir says that my freedom, in order to fulfill itself, requires that it emerge into an open future. But the problem is that that's not only up to the individual. Other people have, can have the power to cut us off from our open future. And this is where love gets extremely political. So Beauvoir was clear in the ethics of ambiguity. She said, we need to ask ourselves under what conditions do we want to live? And our very being is at stake. And her answer is, in the ethics of ambiguity, is do what you must, come what may. But the question is, well, at what cost will we do what we must? 
How far are we willing to go to defend the right to choose the type of relationships we want? And now that we've shifted from arranged marriages a few hundred years ago to love marriages, the question is, what next? Because people are shifting away from love marriages. You know, I like Beauvoir's idea of authentic loving, which involves a mutual recognition of two liberties. Now, it's a little bit ambiguous. I think that's on purpose. Um, and Beauvoir encourages lovers to work it out for themselves. If we're condemned to choose our relationships, then, existentially, we should also expect anxiety. Which brings us to number four. Romantic loving both relieves and creates anxiety. So, I just want to go back to this idea of finding the one and living happily ever after. I mean, let's not deny that this is a beautiful ideal. I mean, I love this picture, it's uh, so romantic. Um, but it's no wonder we want this. It's no wonder that lovers want love to last and want to promise till death do us part. Because romantic relationships seem to promise certainty and comfort in an unpredictable world. They seem to promise relief from fear that, that we're going to be alone forever. And they seem to relieve our anxieties about self-worth because we're valued and appreciated by another person. So there's nothing wrong with hoping that love will last. However, turning it into an absolute, that love must last, this is a problem. And this is what Albert Ellis called masturbating, a term that I was uh, familiarized again with at Stoicon recently. Um, and masturbating does not bring relief. In fact, quite the opposite. And this is a fundamental source of anxiety in love. So Nietzsche says, just don't promise everlasting love because it's a lie. Love is a feeling. Feelings are involuntary. And how can you make a promise based on something you have no control over? Now he's talking about that passionate aspect of love, which does seem to fade with frequency of contact and age. But he makes a good point, I think, that marriage is potentially a leap out of love because we're promising to be with another person in the future, even if we don't love them anymore. So the issue, particularly for Sartre and de Beauvoir, was that because lovers believe that love will last a lifetime, they tend to want to make the other person the primary source of meaning in their lives. But we're creative nothingnesses, we're free to change in unpredictable ways, we're free to be in a relationship, we're free to leave a relationship, and we will never know with perfect confidence to what extent the other person loves us, how long they're going to love us, um, whether they love us as much as we love them, and although we don't want it to end, the possibility always looms over us. So some of the existential solutions to these anxieties of romantic love. So one of Beauvoir's key points was that we should be very careful not to make a lover, like turn them into an idol. We should be really careful about making them the bedrock foundation of our lives because then if the relationship ends, we're going to be devastated. So these are more practical solutions, I think, because people break up all the time and they go and find meaning in relationships with other people. Um, but back in Beauvoir's time, in the 1940s and the 1950s, there were much greater consequences, especially for women, for when a relationship would come to an end. And regarding the anxiety about the length of a relationship. So, romance might not last forever, but thank goodness, can you imagine that the first six months a year, if that went on forever, like how would you get anything done? Daydreaming about the other person all the time. <laughs> No, um, so it, is, it can be distracting, being in love. Um, but so romantic love, it can often shift into, say, friendship or conjugal love. But those are great relationships too. And we shouldn't be disappointed if it does shift into those other relationships. So, I mean, Nietzsche says, he provides a bit of a counterpoint to this. And he says, if we're going to make a commitment to another person, um, we should make sure that we stick to our promises because the ability to make promises is what differentiates us from animals. And he also throws around suggestions like, oh, we should just ban people in love for getting married um, because they're making really serious choices based on a delusion. Um, so he had a sense of humor. So why is this relevant today? Well, 
Compared to when Beauvoir was writing, women are freer than ever to pursue economic independence, need not marry and uh, procreate to survive socially. And with access to birth control and paid parental leave, I mean, not so much in the US, but certainly in other countries, and at least the possibility of a male being the primary carer, you know, it's easier for both men and women, at least in Western society, to have an open future, to choose the type of relationships they, they want. But there are still challenges for all of us in how do we juggle career and relationships? Um, to what extent do we accept gender norms? I mean, it's still the case that women do most of the housework and childcare. Um, how will the gov new government affect our relationships? Well, you know, birth control's under threat. There's been talk about overturning Roe versus Wade. Trump has promised maternity leave, but not parental leave, just maternity leave, which just goes to reinforce these gender stereotypes that women should be at home with the children. So what do we do? Well, first of all, we need to let go of the idea that a long relationship is a good one. Second of all, embrace the anxiety. And three, get politically active. So Simone de Beauvoir says, change your life today, don't gamble on the future, act now without delay. And she says, even not being engaged in politics is still a political action or a political non-action. So be engaged. Okay, number five. Romantic loving is a fertile battlefield. <clears throat> so I mentioned earlier that in love we tend to strive for a harmonious union. But Beauvoir says harmony is never given. We always have to work for it. And I think this is true. She talked about when she first fell in love with Jean-Paul Sartre in The Prime of Life, one of her autobiographies. And she says, very conveniently, I persuaded myself that a foreordained harmony existed between us on every single point. We are, I declared, as one. And this absolute certainty meant that I never went against my instinctive desires. And when on two occasions our desires clashed, I was completely flabbergasted. So I think it's true that lovers fall into the trap of thinking they ought to agree on everything. And that's one of the reasons we look for those checklists. You hate papaya? Oh my god, me too. We're made for each other. No, I'm being. <laughs> um, so, Harmony is never a given, I agree with Beauvoir on that. Um, but we should also recognize that, that, that there can be benefits of alterity. I'm not talking about petty power games and bickering, but rather constructive challenging and critiquing. And this type of alterity can be valuable when it encourages reflections on our modes of being in the world and fosters a greater understanding of ourselves and the world around us by being exposed to new perspectives and new possibilities. And existentially, we discover ourselves through differences. So Nietzsche says, to be a good friend, you have to know how to be an enemy. And the best teachers are the harshest critics. So I think rather than thinking about love as something that should be harmonious, I think it's more useful to think about it as a fertile battlefield. One that's not about destroying each other, but rather about inspiring and encouraging one another and pushing each other to be better and achieving more than we would have ever even thought of alone. And sometimes taking on that contrarian role, you know, the enemy that Nietzsche talked about, is a more helpful basis for self-discovery than unquestioning acceptance. Now, Sartre and Nietzsche were highly skeptical that lovers could also be friends, but Beauvoir certainly thought basing love on a great friendship um, would be the best kind of love relationship. So loving can mean war, but as lovers kind of rise above the power games, the um, possession and submission and domination that Sartre talked about, you know, rivalry still exists, but it's more of a constructive engagement. So why does this matter now? Well, I think lovers tend to overly focus on having things in common, but there's also value in not having things in common too. So let's avoid collapsing into relationships at the expense of other interests in life. I mean, we do want to try and keep lovers close um, so we don't grow apart. And it's scary to let the other person go. But if we keep them too close, then we risk suffocating them. And Nietzsche talked about it as, you know, the trees don't grow so high because of the ivy that clings to them. And he was talking specifically about love and lovers holding each other back. Um, now, and I think there's also... Um, Okay, I'm just going to say a few final comments. So one of the main criticisms about this approach to love 
is that, I mean, how much freedom do we really have? So it's true, we can go about our lives believing that we have no control over anything, being victims of social, biological and cultural processes, but existentially, this is called imminent living. And refusing to take active responsibility for our lives is what Sartre would have called bad faith. So in romantic relationships, we can believe that it's all fate, that's fine, but actually, that's not very romantic. Sartre said, imagine that you're just destined for one another and you fall in love, so the other person doesn't actually appreciate you for your unique qualities, it's just, it's, it's got nothing to do with you. He said, that's actually pretty insulting. Um, so we're responsible for our romantic choices, our relationships, and creating the relationship values together. So in the existential moment here is being aware of your situation and your possibilities. Um, and Nietzsche says invisible threads are the strongest ties. So recognizing what those ties are, whether it's our expectations or expectations from um, people around us. So recognizing our possibilities and actively engaging in love and life. So in love, it's a definitive, I choose you, and acting in ways that support that decision. And this approach is also criticised for being overly pessimistic because it kind of shatters this dream of perfect harmony and a blissful union with a soulmate. It portrays love as war and um, highlights that love can be plagued with anxiety. So I think it's not about lowering expectations, actually, but rather, I mean, instead of crushing relationships under the weight of our expectations and unrealistic ideals. I think if we adjusted our expectations and reinvigorated love um, to make it more meaningful, then I think this is a much more positive way of looking at relationships because it recognizes the importance of striving for freedom to create the type of relationships we want. <coughs> it acknowledges that romantic love can be agony and ecstasy, and rather than striving for docile harmony, Let's strive to base love on great friendship, you know, in which we inspire and support one another. And the existential approach to love kind of reminds me of this Dylan Thomas poem. You know, Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. So I think an existential approach to love is like rage, rage against determinism and our situation and depression. Thank you.